Hey guys, John Paulamy here, Actionable Intelligence. Today is Saturday, April 13th, and this is the weekly market update. The disclaimer, as always, anything that you hear or see on this podcast or video is not to be taken as investment advice. I'm not a registered financial advisor. I cannot give you individual investment advice. This is for entertainment and informational purposes only. Please do your own due diligence. It's your money. It's your responsibility. Um, a couple quick housekeeping notes. Uh, if you noticed, I've been putting out various ways to support the channel. This is a reader or a listener and viewer supported. So there's various ways um, to, if you feel you're getting value and you want to contribute in some way, obviously you can share, like the videos. That's very helpful. That's the best thing that can be done for the videos. We also uh, have a subscription service, Actionable Intelligence Alert Newsletter, 12 issues once a month, usually the first week of the month, where we where we I delve into specific investment themes uh, that are actionable based on what we're talking about in these videos weekly. So the general themes you're hearing in this video kind of dials down to specific ways to take advantage of it. Uh, the other way is uh, I started selling t-shirts now. I make various t-shirts. I'll be adding more to the store. Uh, some people think they're corny. Some people like them. Uh, some people order them. Uh, I'll be adding more, mostly around themes that I like. Uh, you may not like it. That's another way you can go into the show notes and buy me a coffee. There's a link there. So there's various ways to support the channel because I do have expenses. Uh, I spend a lot of money on various periodicals and research uh, every year for the newsletter. And so, you know, internet costs, all these things are costs. And to bring you this stuff, it requires me to do a lot of reading, a lot of investigation and so trying to get good data sources and things like that and subscriptions to various uh, tools that I use uh, to to look for good companies or good for different themes and, and for tracking how I track positions and things like that I use various softwares that cost money so that's why um, also I'm trying to turn this into a full-time business I'm coming up to to the point where I'm getting ready to mail it in on the regular job I think um, and my personal goals to kind of do this full time are getting close to fruition. So I'm trying to really run this like a business in 2024. So those are different ways you can support us. Obviously, you can sign up for the free newsletter. You know, we've taken everything to Substack. We do still have legacy subscribers, but it, everything is on Substack for the new subscribers. We have a free weekly email that I put out in addition to these videos that again, discusses more in depth or has links to various videos or articles that I found uh, useful. Uh, a lot of people seem to like it. And it's a good primer for understanding kind of what I'm looking at and what themes I'm looking at. So the other, there was one other way you can sign up for Patreon. You can support us through Patreon. All these links are in the show notes. Uh, if you pledge $5 a month, I will give you the most current newsletter stock pick that we have. It's a one-time stock pick. It's not every month. Some people get confused. I give you a one, it's a one shot. I give you the last monthly stock pick that we did. We don't necessarily do one every month, but the most current one we have that we added to the portfolio, we give you that. So there's various ways to support the channel, support my work. Uh, some people find the work valuable. Some people are ble bleacher bums and cheap Charlies. They just, you know, that's fine too. Everybody's different. Uh, but those, I just wanted to make people aware of the various ways you can support the channel if you're so inclined. So speaking of the actionable intelligence alert newsletter, I wanted to take the time because the first quarter came to an end. And I never really reviewed the 2023 overall um, return. So I, I want to go back and just do that to show you that, you know, we basically the AIA numbers are here on the left. This is the S&P numbers over here. So basically for 2023, the portfolio all inclusive was up 25.5%. So we slightly beat the S&P, which was up 24% last year. 
Um, in Q1, we slightly underperformed the S&P, but I will say that early in Q2, uh, based on what's happening in a lot of the resource stocks, th this is kind of reversed. So, but if you look at overall, this goes back to January of 2020. I just don't have the data going back sooner than that. I'm not going to go back and try to recreate it. But, uh, and some people might say, well, that's, you know, being creative or you're just picking it. I'm just telling you, this is the data set take it or leave it. So since January 2020, the portfolio has been up, uh, the actual intelligence alert newsletter portfolio, model portfolio is up 247%. The S&P is up 61%. So we've handily beat the S&P. Obviously, you know, in any one year, anything can happen in any one quarter, anything can happen. But I think the methodology that we have, which is to look for undervalued situations, uh, broaden our scope to the entire globe. Set, don't buy things that are overvalued. Look for undervaluation. Look for contrarian situations. Look in sectors and countries and places that other people have written off or aren't looking or have negative pessimism to. What I have found is, in a lot of cases, things are never really as good as people portray it in the media. And things are never really as bad as they're portrayed sometimes. And so you know, one of the things I said that I use is uh, Google Alerts. You can go in there and put a search term and it will send you, you can set up where you get daily notifications, weekly, whatever, for various articles. And one of the terms that I use in my alerts is uninvestable. And so I'm looking, it's sending me, you know, media articles or links to articles or papers or whatever about what's, what is considered uninvestable and what keeps popping up is China. And so I'm not saying, I'm just giving you an example. That's, and so that takes my research to that area. It doesn't necessarily mean I'm going to do anything, but you know, this is how I think about things. This is how I get to arrive at certain decision points. And so, um, you know, we're, we're very knee deep in resource markets because we have a contrarian bent there. It's just, I think we're going to see a, like we've been talking about for a couple of years now, a the underinvestment in all resources is really across the board for pretty much. Everybody here should know the story about uranium. The situation is similar in oil and various base metals. And so we want to understand where the stresses are, like copper, for example, and, you know, follow the news and understand when we see, you know, like the first quantum mine being shut down in Panama, Anglo-American refusing to do an, their expansion, their su supply going down 200,000 tons a year, I think uh, Chile, you know, and just tracking these things because some of these markets are so tenuous now these, uh, with respect to supply and demand that these things are, are having an effect. So I think there's still opportunity there. I think we're in a super cycle because of underinvestment. I think that, uh, Someone that uh, has explained to me, they use this uh, term, the new fertile crescent. You know, I'm paying attention, not necessarily what's going on in Western Europe or the U.S. These things are, these places are having less and less influence every year. Uh, it, it, still big influences, but less and less every year. But I'm more concerned about what's going on in that new fertile crescent from Istanbul through the global south and east to Jakarta and the three and a half to four billion people there that are entering the S-curve of their consumerism and the necessity that resources will play in allowing them to become wealthier. And so that's where I think a lot of the opportunity is. That's where I think a lot of the contrarian, you know, everybody's focused on the shiny object, which is AI and these AI chips. And I fully expect AI to make a significant contribution to the economy, but I don't buy overvaluation. We sell overvaluation here and buy undervaluation. And I think, you know, we have a four-year record at least. We'll continue on. Past performance obviously is no guarantee of future performance, but I think that methodology works. And I think if you will take the time to research the great investors over time, you will note that the majority of them became wealthy by buying things that were undervalued relative to uh, uh, the, the general market. And so that's what we attempt to do here. Big fan of emerging markets, big fan of what's going on in Latin America. A lot of people aren't paying attention to that. Places are cheap. Um, so I think this is this is the first quarter. Numbers uh, slightly lagging the S&P, but uh, 
overall for the longer period of time, easily trouncing and in 2023, slightly beating. So we'll continue on and uh, reporting and doing what we're doing. It seems to be working and we'll see how it works out. So uh, this is interesting, right? You have the mortgage applications to buy a home March, 2024. They're lower now than they were in 2008, guys. So uh, something bad is happening here. Um, again, have I been right on a full-blown, what we would understand as a recession? Not necessarily. I think we've explained it before. Even manufacturing now has turned up. The leading indicators have turned up. And, you know, somebody cracked wise in the comments, well, what about your recession call? Okay. Well, we did have a recession in manufacturing. Um, we did have different sectors that were in recession. We see housing prices coming down. Uh, but, you know, we've had a tremendous amount. I didn't really account for the amount of fiscal spending that was going on and how that was affecting things and the residual effect of all of the free money that was given out post pandemic or during the pandemic. And so, now that we've entered a new rate cutting cycle around the world, uh, even though you know a lot of people focus just on what the U.S. is doing, um, we're seeing that global PMIs are picking up. Rate cutting cycle has, is in place, or as uh, I pointed out a couple of weeks ago, as Greg Weldon said, Money Fest 2024, and so it's just inevitable that the developed world central banks will be cutting rates eventually. They, they they're, they're, we're in a new inflationary cycle. That doesn't mean we're going to be like hyperinflation or 10%, but the, the, the ability to get the inflation rate down to 2% goals, that's going to be, have to be modified simply because what we've talked about in the past, stuff like this is happening. Um, it, it's just uh, the government debt. And it's not just the US, it's the entire world, right? The entire world probably has over $300 trillion in debt. Um, and so all reads, all roads lead to money printing. So that doesn't mean on Monday morning that that's going to matter. But I think I have some charts. So you'll be, I think I was shocked when I saw that Meb Faber put up that kind of shocked me. And I'll show you that later. But um, yeah, that's what. So again, I, I don't think, I think we have a bifurcated economy. Like I said before, the top 40% are doing fine. If you have money, if you have a good job, if you're tied to certain industries, um, you're doing fine. But I think a lot of the you know middle and bottom 60% of the population is not doing well at all. And so I think that um, there's a sense that yes, the numbers can be made to look like everything's fine, but if you go, depending on who you talk to, you know, I think somebody made the comment one time, a recession is when your neighbor loses their job, a depression is when you lose your job. So I think things are relative, but this is not like positive. And the reason why is because rates are too high and prices for houses are too high. Okay. And we're seeing that I follow various bloggers that and prices are coming down. This is going to be a tremendous opportunity, I I think, once the rate raising the rate cutting cycle begins in earnest uh, in the US. I think it'll be a tremendous opportunity. This will obviously reverse, I think. So here's the CEO. Uh, this is from Jesse Felder. Um, you can go look this article up, the letter to shareholders from Jamie Dimon. Basically the summary is, you know, Jamie Dimon's seen higher inflation and why? I mean, we've talked about these things. You should be able to see them and notice them. But all of the following factors appear to be inflationary. Ongoing fiscal spending, yes. Remilitar remilitarization of the world, yes, because you know everybody in the, the, the globalists in Western Europe are you know scared that the Russians are going to take over, which isn't going to happen. They're not going to go into Western Europe. And so we have to spend more money on defense, right? That's inflationary because you're spending money that you don't have. Restructuring of global trade, right? You know, globalization of what people defined it as, you know, the end of history or whatever, open borders, open trade. Yeah, that went away. Now, as, this, as the world's bifurcating into this multipolar world, trade in Asia and amongst the global East and South is fine. Okay, it's the West that is uh, making itself a pariah to, to the rest of the world. And so costs are going to go up. If you bring the chip manufacturing to Arizona and try to do it there, uh, you're, you know, you're being having to be subsidized by the federal government because no one would build a chip factory here with their own money. 
doesn't make any sense. Uh, and so the, the, the costs are higher, you know, so all of these things are like death by a thousand cuts. Individually, these things are not going to move the needle, but if you take them collectively, they have the ability to move, to have the inflation rate be at a higher rate. And I don't think people have, um, people have fully absorbed that new reality. I mean, I think Jamie Dimon's been on record saying he could see bond rates, treasury rates up at 8% eventually because they don't seem to be able to get this. I don't think that'll happen because the economy would go into a deflationary depression and the government would go bankrupt. They can't afford it. But uh, I think what's going to happen is, you know, yield curve control and just the acceptance of a higher run rate for inflation and they'll sell it somehow. Um, and, you know, if you aren't able, if you don't have assets, and I'll talk about this later, I've talked about it in previous articles in the Actionable Intelligence Alert newsletter, the paid newsletter on the Cantillon effect. If you're close to the money printing, if you own real assets, you're going to do fine. You'll be able to stay ahead. You'll be able to actually prosper. It's the people that don't have assets, the people that live paycheck to paycheck, the people that live hand to mouth that are feeling the brunt of this. And that's where the discontent's coming from. So going on, you know, the restraint of global trade, capital needs of the green economy. Another thing that they're trying to do this transition with debt, they don't have the money to do it. That's going to cost more money. Electricity prices go up, uh, the more green energy you put in, in into effect. Um, and possibly higher energy costs. Yes, we're going to have higher energy costs due to a lack of needed investment. And so all of these things coming together are going to result likely in a in a period of time where prices are going to be elevated higher than people think. So I wanted to point this out. This was uh, what I talk about buying undervaluation and selling overvaluation. Here's a tweet by Will Slaughter. He says, as X XOM, which is Exxon Mobil, quietly celebrates a fresh all-time high today, it's worth remembering this magnificently stupid tweet from one of the worst investors in the world. Cumulative total returns since posting this nonsense on July 15th, 2020. And what's he talking about? He's talking about Kathy Wood. The, you know, she was every one of these eras or these bubblicious things, they always have this person that's like the mascot of it, if you will, right? There was a guy during the nifty 50 era in the 70s. His name was Gerald Tazai. And he was that guy then. Then you had, you know, if you remember like in the 80s, Abby Joseph Cohen, you know, she was the big market caller at Goldman Sachs, uh, you know, and then you had the guy Henry Blodgett during the internet bubble. So we had Kathy Wood here during our little bubble. And she said back here on July 15th, 2020, this is, like I said, this is very contrarian. If you remember this tweet, I remember this. It said, oil demand probably hit a secular peak last year. And thanks to EVs, now is in secular decline. Though ARC has no formal forecast, I believe that oil prices are on their way back to $12 a barrel, the level reached after the 1973 oil cartel crisis, or lower, now that EVs are taking off. Well, that didn't happen, did it? And so if you look at the cumulative returns on the ARC fund and Exxon Mobil since this galactically stupid tweet that she made on July 15, 2020, uh, Exxon Mobil's up 233% and the ARC fund is down 40%. And so again, when all the hype was going on with Kathy Wood and the ARC fund, I mean, that was the time to get away from that stuff. Uh, when you're a bleacher bum or a shoe clerk or an average retail investor, and you're you know seeing Kathy Wood talking about robots and EVs and self-driving vehicles and you know Tesla going to two thousand dollars a share, whatever nonsense they were saying, that's not gonna. Again, things are never as good as people portray them, but they're never as bad. And that was the thing in the oil patch. If you understand energy, if you understand the world how it works, if you understand these things, you understood that we've spent $5 trillion on renewables and hydrocarbon use has declined from 81% to 80%. Okay. This is a real problem because eventually, you know, we will, hydrocarbons will become scarce. Okay. And I have no doubt that, you know, if battery technology improves, if various technologies improve, you know, but I kind of like what Jim Kunstler said, you know, he's kind of a, 
grumpy old man that a lot of people don't like to listen to, but he said, you know, this, this idea that, you know, I'm, I'm living here in right now, making this video in my apartment in Southwest Houston in Rosenberg. And there's a freeway that goes down to the, you know, Valley that they're making it at the new, a new interstate. They're building all these highways out. People are building subdivisions. I mean, you're already from where I'm at is like all used to be farmland and they're still building out further down towards Wharton, down towards Victoria. And it's just the same thing. You know, you go five miles, there's another exit, build shopping centers on both sides and then subdivisions behind it and keep going further and further out. I mean, and it's all based on the ubiquity and relative affordability of oil because people, as James Kunstler calls it, the happy motoring society. And it wasn't going to be replaced by, you know, lithium ion batteries and electric vehicles. Now, it very well could be. I never say never. I've learned that lesson. But you can see right here, this is this. So, you know, you pick your fighter is what I'm saying, cor you know, correctly, you know, pick your guru co correctly, uh, really think through it. You know, there's a lot of people, especially younger people, younger men, they really like tech, they're into tech. You know, they like to see the, the reusable rockets land on the barge. They think that's so cool. Tom Swift, you know, fan science fiction, tech will solve all of our problems. Well, don't count on it. Don't count on it. Um, as I've talked about before, energy inputs, excessive amounts and surpluses of energy inputs have allowed us to make a lot of advances. And I have no doubt that with the collective mind of all these people on earth that will come up with solutions, but doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be a straight linear line. Okay. And there will be challenges and there will be opportunities. And when I see somebody like this making, when she made this, this kind of claim, this was a, this was a buy signal. Okay. It's contrarian. I remember, I remember these stupid comments when during the pandemic and they, they, made people by force stay in their houses. Of course, oil demand went down and people were extrapolating that. Well, see, this is our opportunity. We can get off oil. What I understood from that whole lesson was we were like slightly under 100, before the pandemic, slightly under 100 million barrels a day of oil usage. And we locked the entire world down and oil demand only dropped to about 80 million barrels. I was like, I was shocked. So even when we dropped locked everybody up in these major economies, stopped doing everything for a period of time, we only were able to drop oil demand by, you know, around 20% temporarily. So that tells you how ubiquitous it is and how integrated hydrocarbons in, are into the society. Now, if you want to change society and have a poorer society, uh, people living like in Soviet block type houses and apartments, I mean, you can, you can really reduce oil demand. If you want to have 15 minute cities, you know, where people aren't commuting, like I said, from Wharton to wherever they're working in Houston, 50 miles each way, 60 miles each way to work. Well, that's only going to be enabled by, you know, oil under, you know, around where it's at right now. And if we, because of the underinvestment and because of the growth in the emerging markets, I think oil's going to much higher, as I've said before. So, this kind of just is a good exercise, thought exercise to really pay attention when things are overvalued and not fall into the trap of extrapolating the current reality linearly. I've done that before when I was younger and it cost me a lot of money. Don't do that. Wanted to point this out, it's something else. Um, could be an opportunity, right? UK stock prices are cheap relative to the US. U UK equities traded a steep discount to the US. I'm not saying go out and buy UK stocks, but it's worth looking at. It's cheap relative to the US. Now, I'm not a big fan of the fact that Keir Starmer's and Labour's going to get back in power, but I don't think the UK is going to dry up and blow away. And so it's probably worth taking a look at some of the um, some of the companies there. I mean, I'm by... I, in the dividend portfolio, I'm starting to put together that I'm going to be adding to the actionable intelligence alert newsletter as a separate portfolio tracking tool. One of the stocks I have in there is a UK based bank that's uh, doing very well buying back shares and pays like a something like a 7% dividend and has possibly 50 to 100% upside from here. And so there are always opportunities and you just can't, you know, again, looking for undervaluation. Um, in my own personal portfolio, I've owned the um, Domino's UK PLC uh, for a while. And, you know, 
It's a cash flow machine. Uh, got taken over by new management a few years ago. They straightened everything out. It's cash flowing nicely. What are they doing? Buying back stock, slowly expanding the business. So there's always opportunity. And when you find places that have relative undervaluation, you should be drawn to that and look for the opportunity in those areas, not just write them off. Just pointing that out. China, undervalued, hated. UK, undervalued. Looking at a political shift towards the center left to left, that's going to scare people off. Could be opportunity. So again, uh, it's interesting. I put here as the title of this slide, the world needs oil and gas. This is uh, another guy I follow on Twitter or X. And he's talking about uh, Barclays, a big bank, uh, bank and investment firm in the UK. Um, it says, unapologetic, Barclays restarts EP coverage. And when they said in their coverage, when they came out, said the world needs oil and gas. Barclays analysts in restarting coverage of exploration and production companies presented anti-hydrocarbon investors with a, quote, reality check on the energy transition. Now, I couldn't get to it as a Bloomberg article, so it was paywalled. But again, this is positive when we see, you know, that's why I said the zeitgeist is changing. It has changed. People understand that we're not going to go to whatever ill-defined or undefined, whatever net zero is, and the hydrocarbons aren't going away, and standing in the road with an orange polyester vest made of petroleum like the stop oil people in the UK do, holding up signs, isn't going to do anything because the rest of the population, which is the majority, the 0.001% that stand in the street and block traffic, are, don't have any policy impact. People are not going to give up their standard of living for a ill-defined or undefined climate change agenda that's very nebulous and goalposts are always moving they don't they, people just don't see it and they're not going to they're not going to cut their standard of living or be inconvenienced by it they're just not and so the zeitgeist is changing and so this is why you know in the end with these investment firms and investment banks and banks and uh, investors the bottom line's the bottom line it's hey you know you got Brent trading around $90 a barrel, WTI around 85. You know, at these prices and with the amount of cash flow that we've seen in a lot of these smaller companies or mid cap companies, especially in Canada, almost all the debt's been paid, a lot of the debt's been paid off. And so now we're cycling, we've been cycling into and continue to cycle into capital returns to shareholders. Nobody's running out and doing massive projects yet. Okay. And so the current, thinking is return capital to shareholders. They're happy. The board's happy. I'm happy. Everybody's happy. No one's walking into the board of directors and saying, I want to spend, you know, five or $10 billion on this huge expansion because, you know, you'll, you'll be laughed out of there. They'll just be like, we just need to keep returning share cash to shareholders and everybody's happy. And so, you know, that's where the returns are. As I showed you with the Exxon returns, which is the large, one of the largest publicly traded oil companies, it's up 240% over the last several years. So nothing wrong with that. And people see that and it's like, okay, we got to get back into this. So here we go. This is uh, another guy that's pretty good on X. He makes like these little short videos on X. And I'm talking about the Cantillon effect, right? And the money printing and how it affects people. It says here, the rich get richer, the poor get inflation, and we can thank the Federal Reserve. Yes, the closer you are to the king in Cantillon's time, or the closer you are to the money printing, uh, the richer you get. If you have hard assets or assets, you get richer during money printing. Poor people get the inflation and the price increases. Less here, you need to own assets. Now, I've said this before, and people kind of mock me, the society is going to get more and more bifurcated. If you don't own assets, you're going to be living a life of serfdom. You're not going to own anything. It's not going to be because of Klaus Schwab. It's just going to be, you're just not going to own anything. You have to get, if you got to jungle up with five other people, you got to put a bankroll together. I've been saying that for years. you got to get in the game. This is the game. Do I agree with it? No. Do I think that it should be changed? Yes. Do I think that the Federal Reserve should have the ability to do what it's doing? No. Do I have the power to change it? No. So you... The game, you know, don't hate uh, the player, hate the game. 
There's nothing you can do about it. You're not going to change it. Keep, you know, vote harder. They're going to audit the Fed. They're going to shut the Fed down. We're going to go back to hard money. No, it's not going to happen. Not anytime soon. And so what they're going to continue to do is these cycles of inflation, money printing, and then when it gets starts to get out of control, raise rates like they've done. That's all they have. They have a 10-pound hammer that they're running around trying to kill houseflies with. And so it causes a lot of problems and a lot of damage. So going on with, the, with this tweet, it says, the rich get richer, the poor get inflation, and we can thank the Federal Reserve. Last week, the Fed released a new study that wealth of the top 1% in America hit an all-time high of $45 trillion. That's up $15 trillion, or 50%, from 2020. What happened in 2020, the pandemic? What was the response? A whole bunch of fiscal spending and money printing. So the pandemic has, ju has been just about the best thing to happen to America's rich in, oh, about a century. The reason's simple. They printed $6 trillion and poured it into financial markets and cheap loans to the rich. Well, that's not exactly true, but it's pretty much. It's the Cantillon effect. They printed money. We explained this long article in the AIA newsletter. The closer you are to the king and the gold, or in modern times, the closer you are to the printing press, you're going to benefit. If you don't own any assets, you're just going to pay higher prices. We're all going to pay higher prices, but if you own hard assets, if you own the assets that benefit from the money printing, then you can stay ahead of the inflation. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, but this is the game. Your wages won't keep, you know, if you're just a wage slave, you're not going to keep up. And people will say, well, the inflation rate topped out around 9%, but now it's down to like three and a half. Yeah, but it, the rate of change just went down. It's still, prices still go up over time and the debasement of the currency continues. And, and most people don't seem to understand this. And it's like, well, how can I get ahead? You got to do whatever you got to do. You got to put a bankroll together. Instead of, you know, waking up, you know, watching Netflix Friday until 1 a.m., you should be out there driving Uber, DoorDash, whatever you got to do, man. You got to put a bankroll together and you got to get assets. You just got to figure it out. You got to make it happen. Because if you don't, you know, you're not going to be, you know, if you think you're just going to go and, vote your way to prosperity you're not things are going to get more difficult taxes are going to go up over time the inflation is going to get worse the debasement you're in a declining empire you should read about other declining imp read about the romans read about the byzantines read about the uk read about you know 14th and 15th century portugal and spain it's the same thing over and over and over so um there's nowhere to run to. There's nowhere to hide. You got to deal with reality for what it is. And this is the game. You know, they're going to keep these rates where they're at until something breaks. Believe me, they want to cut rates, but they can't do it with the stock market where it's at and unemployment rate ostensibly where it's at. So they need air cover. They need a crisis so that everybody says, we don't care, print money. And so, you know, that's What's, that's what you're seeing around the rest of the world now. The money, the, the, the rate cuts and the money printing's already started. We just haven't seen the big bazookas fire yet. But they will. It's just a matter of time. So here was an article I put here. It's like, gold protects you from central bank and government malfeasance. I've said that before. Uh, this was from a, uh, what's his name? Uh, last name Blumenthal. He puts out a weekly paper, but he quoted uh, Peter Bookvar. And this is from Peter Bookvar's recent uh, distribution. It says, in 1970, right before Nixon took us off what was left of the post-World War II Brenton Woods gold standard, one dollar bought you about three gallons of gasoline. Today, that same one dollar will buy you about 27% of one gallon of gasoline. So in 1970, when the price of gold was fixed at $35 an ounce, an ounce bought you about 100 gallons of gasoline. Today, at around $23.50, an ounce of gold buys you about 650 gallons of gasoline. Pretty good protection against inflation. Is gold not an inflation hedge? Of course it is. There are times when it might lag, but over almost 55 years since 1971, monetary system change, it's done a pretty good job, unquote. And I, I agree with that. And this is what shocked me, this next slide. This is from Meb Faber. I was talking about this earlier. 
This is from 1973 to 2024. You know, you've heard about the 60-40 portfolio, right? That the your local um, Edward Jones financial advisor was trained to put you into 60% stocks, 40% bonds. The thinking being, if stocks went down, uh, you know, rates would get cut and your bonds value would go up. And that would be, you know, they would offset each other. But what I found, so here's the returns, right? So over 73 to 2024, the 60-40 stock bonds portfolio averaged 9.73%. And if you go down, the maximum drawdown was around 30%. That's for like 50 years. I was shocked when I saw this. Uh, if you would have had 60, 40, 60% 60 stocks and 40% gold, it, your returns were actually slightly better. You had, uh, as you can see, and your draw, I mean, it was pretty much the same, all right? Slightly better in golds, but slightly more volatile with gold. So, you know, I think, in, and this was a time when uh, on the 60-40 portfolio for stocks and bonds, where was, you know, people didn't, we weren't as bad off in the fiscal situation we are now in the governments around the world. But I think things are going to get worse. This is why I think it's imperative and why I've said you have to own physical gold uh, as a hedge against, as I've said before, government and central bank malfeasance. This research, this is actually shocking when I saw this. So it doesn't mean it will continue, but this was eye-opening for me. There's really no reason if you're going to have a, like, so if you remember, I put a chart up a couple months ago, or maybe a few weeks ago, maybe a month ago, the amount of financial advisors and financial planners, they have like most of them have like less than 1% exposure to their have for their clients have less than 1% exposure to gold. Cause that's what they've been trained, right? It's hard to change this thinking, uh, but it will change over time because the 60, 40 stock bond just won't work going forward. And so there'll be a slow change and you'll see capital. It, it, it will take years, but it will happen. But this was, uh, this was, Awesome. I, I didn't know this, but this is uh, this was very interesting. So we're talking about copper prices. You know, we're getting ready. Uh, things have been on the move, obviously, with global PMIs, purchasing manager indexes above 50 and climbing. Uh, we've shown the correlation. We've shown the history that when that happens, the energy and metals inputs needed to uh, sustain or fuel that uh, increased growth in manufacturing uh, is being translated now to metal prices, i.e. copper. Uh, copper already, we've talked about over and over again, how underinvested it is in the supply demand deficit. It's going much higher. I don't know how high, but uh, I've heard people, you know, I've heard Gordon and Rosenzweig say that there's no reason why it couldn't go to $10 a pound by the end of this decade. But anyways, onto this article, it says copper continued its upward charge, hitting the highest level since June 2022, as investors bet that curtailed ore supply will continue will struggle to keep up with rising global demand. Yep, that's it. It's just supply demand. Copper has found itself strongly positioned after a mine supply shock late last year. It's now that is combining with better than expected consumption as global manufacturing usage picks up. Prices have also benefited as investors start to pivot into commodities as a hedge against renewed inflation fears. The concentrates market has tightened dramatically as smelters have been expanding capacity, while mine supply has been disrupted by the sudden shutdown of the first quantum mine, uh, Cobra Panama mine, Cobra Panama mine, removing roughly 400,000 tons of metal from the world, and the outlook for mine copper tightened further after Anglo-American announced it was scaling back output by about 200,000 tons. I think the on the Anglo-American story, if I'm not mistaken, I think this is in Chile, the, there was a mine there that they were going to expand, and the goofy government was like, you have to, as a stipulation to, and I, I may be mistaken, but I believe it was in Anglo-American in Chile, the government there told them that they had to pay for the displacement of like 40,000 wood burning stoves in the Santiago, uh, Chile metro area. And they were like, no, we're not doing that. That's not what we do. We're not doing that. So stick it in your back, pack sand. We're not doing it. So, you know, 
the, 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 the confiscation of this mine or the shutdown of this mine in Panama, which was ridiculous. I mean, it was like a $10 billion investment or something like that. I mean, first quantum now is just going to have to go to the international arbitration and spend a decade and they'll eventually win an arbitration. And then it'll be like, how do you get your money out of Panama? I mean, this is the, when the market is this tight and you have this, this much under investment, this is what you're going to see. It doesn't take much to shift the balance from slight oversupply to a slight undersupply. And those small shifts can result in massive changes in the underlying commodity price, as we've explained before. And so here's a recent chart, obviously, copper near 15-month high. I mean, it's looking to break out here going back to December. If it breaks out here, this is in tons, price per ton. Uh, but, uh, I mean, I think I saw the gold, uh, copper price around 430, 434, something like that in the last week or so. I don't look at it every day. But again, I, I, if you remember, I, I threw a free pick out there for a company that I've owned and currently own in my personal portfolio, um, Amerigo Resources, which is basically a company that processes tailings from uh, copper mines in Chile. They don't actually do any mining. It's basically just a manufacturing process. And, you know, they do well when copper prices go up. And so uh, I think they were paying, and at the time I bought it, around an 8% dividend. They So we should be, you know, that, that stock now starting to start to move in anticipation of higher cash flows. So we'll see. So I think it's amusing to watch like the IEA and the EIA do their demand forecast. They're politicized because they're government entities and the governments want more renewables and want oil to go away. And so they were like Kathy Woods, right? They were preaching that or saying that oil demand was going to go down. That was their forecast. And they've been wrong. Uh, oil has passed uh, easily passed its pre-pandemic demand levels. We're up running around 102 million barrels a day, slightly higher. It will continue to move higher over time, um, at least for the foreseeable future. And here's what OPEC's forecast. Now, OPEC obviously is incentivized to be more bullish on oil demand because they sell oil. So I get that. I get biases are inherent there. People are... But uh, it's just interesting to look at the IEA forecasts for um, and the OPEC uh, forecasts. So you have in blue the OPEC, in black the IEA. So it says latest forecast of production increase from March level needed to balance supply and demand. Um, you know. By Q4 2024, two and a half million barrels a day. I expect if we get into the summer driving, when we get into the summer driving season here in the U.S. and the travel season in the Northern Hemisphere happens every summer. I expect gas gasoline prices to top four dollars a gallon. This is not good in an election year where Biden's already struggling. He's going to get hit by Trump hard on that. Don't don't think there's still room in the SPR to do further releases. I, I suspect that they'll do that for political reasons. They'll pull out all the stops. Um, there's a lot of angst in the media, in government, in the establishment, if you will. That means both the Republican and Democratic parties, uh, that orange, the return of orange, orange man bad. And so uh, with the inflation where it's at, with the crime problem, with the border, uh, with all these fiascos going on in these uh, cities, and then if you want to throw $4 plus gasoline on top of it, and you're only seven months out from the election, um, I would say that if we see oil getting close to $100 a barrel, you can expect SPR releases. I wouldn't be surprised, though. Uh, OPEC has, I think, been talking about, if I'm not mistaken, uh, holding their production cuts to the end of the year. And I wouldn't be surprised if the Russians, you know, they've already announced some production cuts uh, just to, like I said, it doesn't take much. They don't have to just say, we're going to stop exporting oil. You just need to keep it in a slight deficit and draw on inventories and that price will climb. So um, the U.S. isn't the only entity in the world that can use its resources or its economic advantages for political gain. Uh, I think it would the global East and South would look more favorably on a return of orange man bad than a continuation of the 
post-World War II international rules-based order that is currently in place in the U.S. and Europe. I mean, don't forget you have European Parliament elections in June. Uh, that's going to be interesting. And, you know, if you look at the popularity of a lot of these current governments, they're not our characters that are in government. I mean, Richie Sunak is going to be out. Keir Starmer is going to be in the UK. Tories are going to get destroyed by labor, but labor is no better, right? So you're just going to, you know, and so I think you're just going to see these big swings back and forth in political sentiment because people are just totally frustrated and there's nobody actually representing them because there's an establishment there and you can't get to that level. You can't get the access. This is why uh, I am a big Trump fan, not because Look, he's a BSer, he's a narcissist, but that's all you got right now. He represents, you know, a stick in the eye. Who am I going to, who else am I going to vote for? Chris Christie, Nikki Haley. These people don't represent, they're all part of this thing, you know, and Trump's not, definitely not perfect, but it's, it's, I know that the, that, the, that he's not fully tied in. Now there's a lot of policies I don't like, I'm not going to get into but it's better than any alternative we have there. And, uh, you know, so I think that don't be surprised if you see OPEC and the Russians not cooperating with um, cutting or, or not cooperating with increasing oil production. I don't think, you know, if, you know, if they had their brothers, they would rather see the orange man in than another four years of what we got in there now. Um, and so that's, they can do that without drawing a lot of attention to themselves. And so again, expect if oil prices do go up uh, through the summer, as we get closer to the election, you get oil prices above $4 a gallon. Again, that's just going to complicate things on the inflation front here too. So a lot of moving pieces here. You got to look beyond just the, the headlines. And uh, so, you know, if you're listening to the IEA and the EIA, they're, of course, they're government financed institutions and these governments, these globalist governments want less oil. So, of course, they're going to estimate less demand. OK, remember demand was going to go down. Remember Kathy Wood? She wasn't the only one saying that. A lot of these organizations were saying the same thing. So here's uh, again, this guy, I can't pronounce his last name, Dan Subuchi. I don't know. He's on X. You should follow this energy tidbits the guy puts out like a 30 or 40 page thing every weekend about oil energy markets and he has these great it's called energy tidbits he has these great access to a lot of these people that know what's going on and i really get good value and it's free i can't believe it's free and the guy doesn't even have like ten thousand subscribers i don't think i don't remember but he should have like hundreds of thousands of subscribers it's like the best um curation of the week's energy news in one thing i mean i can't even get through the whole thing i just browse it and look for things but this is something i found here and i follow him on x um he says right here and india reality check exclamation point and he's talking this was a guy from trafigura rich and richard holtam he's like a some big shot over there at that oil trading firm this is a quote for him he says I was in Mumbai last week, and anyone that thinks they're all going to be driving Teslas in a few years' time hasn't seen the reality on the ground. There's going to be sustained and increasing demand for fossil fuels for the next five, ten years or so. And so, yeah, because affordability, access, okay, uh, your progression in the these developing markets is, you know, from a bicycle or walking to a scooter to a small car or small little pickup or a small little SUV, that's the progression, right? And when you buy a scooter or a internal combustion vehicle, car, or what have you, you don't just park in the garage. These people drive them and use it. So oil demand will increase over time. And it's very easy to track this, guys. It's not like this is an unknown. We know as countries increase per capita GDP, they require a certain amount of copper, a certain amount of oil, a certain amount of what have, okay? And what's, this just all ties into my general theme. You know, I mean, India is just one country. You know, China is still doing this. Bangladesh, the Philippines, Indonesia, that's what I'm talking about, that new fertile crescent, that new arc 
of the global east and south from Istanbul all the way through the stands, all the way through, you know, Russia, India, China, through Indonesia and, you know, the Philippines, all of that, that encompassing of four plus billion people, whatever it is. Okay. I mean, this is why I talk about places like Uzbekistan. It's off everybody's radar. I mean, but, you know, growth is happening in all these places. Energy demand is cannot keep up. The supply of energy cannot keep up with the demand. And you can't grow an economy without continually increasing the energy inputs. That's why nuclear is such a, you know, it's going to make and break fortunes. It's going, if you're not involved in this, if you don't understand this, I mean, I hate to use these terms, you're not going to make it. And, you know, the, the money's there. You know, do you have the intellect? Do you have the conviction? Do you have the ability to see it? So uh, this is what we talk about. I mean, and I think it can change lives. So understanding this, at least over the next five to 10 years, the opportunity. So here we go. Electricity prices surging. Electricity prices have accelerated higher. This goes back to like 1954. Um, you see that surges back in the 70s and 80s when we had the Arab oil embargo, and when we had... Um, inflation then you know it came back down and then you know now we're we're going back up again you know we don't have enough electricity in the in the world for what they're talking about doing you want to electrify everything they want to get rid of natural gas stoves they want to electrify it okay they want to get rid of natural gas heating they want to electrify it okay you want to get rid of internal combustion engines you want to have electric vehicles okay you everything has to be electrified okay that's the goal, right? Because climate change, okay. But you're not building enough plants. You're not building enough generation. And so prices are going up. And as you add more of these intermittent sources, the price goes up over time. Why? Because when the intermittent sources aren't operating, I'm sorry, you cannot change reality. Solar doesn't work at night. Wind doesn't, the, the capacity factors are not there. And so when they're not working, which is majority of the time, you have to have backup. So now you're paying for two sources. That's why the cost goes higher. Um, if I showed you, I can't show you this, but we built this solar farm, 70 megawatts. We built a substation on our side because we have to collect all of the, you know, we have inverters out there in the solar field takes the DC, converts it to AC, it goes to our substation that we built. It's a very simple substation, has a transformer, it elevates the voltage, then it goes across to the utilities substation. And this thing that they built is like three times bigger than ours. They pull out all the stops, huge control building over there, big tower, lattice tower for the communications. And all of that goes into the rate base, guys. You're paying for that. Okay, it's cost plus for them. So they don't, they're not, their substation is like three times bigger than ours. It's got all the bells and whistles. It's ours is bare bones because we have to build things within a budget. They just say, well, this is what's required to build it to the utility standard. And so every solar or wind farm has the same situation typically, or they have to do an expansion on an existing yard. And so they just say, okay, it costs this much. Throw it into the rate base, the rate payer pays. And so this is why prices go up. And now they're talking about electrifying everything. And there's no policy being articulated on how that's going to happen. The transmission constraints, okay? Yes, you can have places where solar and wind are very viable and make sense from a generation perspective, but there's been no transmission built to get it out of there. It's the same thing you're seeing in the Permian right now. There's not enough takeaway capacity for the natural gas that's being produced along with the oil that's being produced. And so natural gas prices are at negative pricing again. Okay, so this is why you have Bitcoin mining guys and stuff like that going and, and taking advantage of these things. But this isn't, there's no, what's the policy? Are we going to spend trillions of dollars increasing the grid? I'm not hearing this. 
everybody's running out and building generation plants, but this is what we find when we go around. I have to go to these site visits. It's like, okay, well, the site looks good, but we have a transmission constraint. So we go to another site. Yeah, the site looks good. We can build here. It's not a problem. We have transmission constraints. And so no one's really talking about that. Okay. They're, everybody's put the cart in front of the horse. So going back to AI again and the power demands, you know, again, people have literally extrapolated AI indefinitely into the future. It's probably going to get bigger, but it's probably not going to get as big as people think as fast as they thought because there's just too many constraints. And so here's a couple of tweets from an article. It says AI models such as OpenAI's ChatGBT are just insatiable in terms of their thirst for electricity. That was a quote from uh, that they were talking about uh, this at a conference. The more information they gather, the smarter they are. But the more information they gather to get smarter, the more power it takes. Without greater efficiency, quote, by the end of the decade, AI data centers could consume as much as 20 to 25 percent of U.S. power requirements. Today, that's probably 4 percent or less. It's not going to happen. OK, and so. Um, you're not going to build out the grid. You're not going to be able to, this is not sustainable. This is why you see people trying to make deals of putting these things right next to nuclear power plants and where the big power sources are and getting the power before it even gets to the grid. This is why Amazon did what they did. I saw another company trying to do it uh, with another nuclear plant. You're going to see more of this, right? This is also going to be great for like SMRs once that gets going. And so I think it can be done, but it's not going to be done by the end of the decade. And so that's going to constrain the ability of the growth of this because of the power consumption, unless they can make the things way more efficient, okay, which is always possible. But right now, I don't think you're going to have AI data centers consuming 25% of the U.S. power by the end of the decade. It's just not, I don't think it will happen. And that's what this says here. It says, this guy says, quote, that's hardly very sustainable, to be honest with you. Yeah, I'd say goes on, it says, in a January report, the National Energy Agency, remember old friends at the IEA, said a request to chat GPT requires 2.9 watt hours of electricity on average. So if you make a chat uh, request, an AI question, it requires 2.9 watt hours of electricity, equivalent to turning on a 60 white light bulb for just under three minutes. That is nearly 10 times as much as the average Google search. So you start breaking this down to what it really means. It's again, it's another one of these law of large numbers. They're, they're, you get certain large numbers; it's like inconceivable to the average person, because a lot of people are just their th our thoughts work in a linear progression, and that's just not going to happen. More than likely, the agency said. Power demand by the AI industry is expected to grow by at least 10 times between 2023 and 2026. That's crazy. So I think that's going to be a limiting factor, the growth of AI. But I think it's going, these tech people, you know, it's interesting. Uh, I have another article here uh, I'll get into later on. Uh, I'll talk about it. But do I think this is going to happen? I think it will move towards that, more AI, more power consumption. Do I think it'll take over a quarter of the U.S. electricity consumption in, by the end of the decade? No. I mean, what, what, what's the rest of the economy going to do? So you're going to be a big push by these tech billionaires, and they do control the Democratic Party, okay? They do have a lot of influence on the Uniparty. Money talks. No one cares. You know, lip service is paid to environmentalists, but when the, you know, how things work in Washington or these state capitals is, um, if you put money into the sock, drop money in the sock. That's how you get access because it's all run by money. Yeah, they'll play, you know, lip service to environmental things here and there. But in the end, okay, money talks and you know what walks. So here's John Quace, higher for longer. I titled the slide, boom, in Q1, Bank of America said they expected uranium supply to rebalance with nuclear fuel demand in 2025. But today, extended that by four years, now expend, expecting a supply deficit until the end of 2029. Well, welcome home, Bank of America. 
They've raised their U308 price forecast to $120 in 2025 and 135 in 2026. Uh, yeah, so do I care what Bank of America thinks? No, when, I'm, when I post this is, is for a reason, sediment. Okay, sediment is shifting. We need the institutional money to come into the uranium market to really blast it off. Okay, and this is the type of, you know, they put out research. They have analysts. They have people that sell to their, you know, people that are investing money. They say, hey, you really need to take a look at uranium. This, this is our research on it. And then somebody reads it and goes, gee, yeah, okay, buy Cameco or whatever they're doing over there. This We need to see, we're seeing more of this now, not less of it. And the sediment will shift. More, more money comes into the market. Prices go up. Stock price prices go up. It's self-fulfilling prophecy because, again, if they actually thought until recently, evidently, Bank of America analysts until recently thought that the supply-demand balance um, deficit in uranium would be satisfied in 2025, well, they're not paying attention. What kind of analysts are these? We knew that. It's, it's likely going to be I, – I can't tell you when it will rebalance because the projects just aren't on the board yet. Now, I think enough capital will come in to solve the problem. You know, if the price goes two, three, four hundred dollars a pound, is that not is that impossible? No, not in the right environment. I don't see any new major mines. Yeah, we've had these old brownfield mines that were mothballed or put in care and maintenance during the um, last several years that uranium prices were down. They've come back online. They, people have done a good job. Langer Heinrich's back online. The Encore assets in Texas are back, coming back. Or one's online, another one's being commissioned, brought back online. Boss Energy's bringing their site back online. But this is it's like, it's like peeing into the ocean. It's not going to move the needle. For those companies, it will. But for the overall supply demand, and you're seeing more and more reactors being built. I mean... Guys, think about it. If you're going to do this AI, if you're going to do all this electricity consumption, we have, and we're not even talking about just the general rise in power consumption in the global east and south, okay? And they're going to have data centers also. I mean, this is like unlimited. That's why I try to tell people it's unlimited demand. And for the last 10, 20 years of my life, I've sat here and watched as people have poo-pooed the resource market. We don't need it. Everything's tech, 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 high tech. You know, tech, tech, tech. If, but I, I have the, the saying that I never forgot, which was, if you don't mine it or grow it, you don't have it. And we've totally ignored that choo-choo train 19th century economy that underpins all the rest of the other areas of the economy. And now we're going to learn that lesson because of the trillions of dollars of underinvestment that's happened across the entire resource sector. I think we're look, waking up for a tremendous tremendous bull market. So this is what we wanted to get to. Um, so as we get to this AI cranking up and stuff like that, all these technological innovations of all these tech billionaires want to do, Bill Gates, Bezos, all these people, they want to build all these tech centers. They're all into this stuff. All the tech bros love it. It's going to run smack dab into the environmental lobby. And what they want to do, they want less consumption. They want less capitalism. They want less energy usage because climate change. Don't you understand we're all going to die? Well, everybody that actually knows what's going on knows that's not going to happen. And so when you have two lobbying groups or two groups of people, yes, the environmentalists are, are have funding, but they don't have the kind of money that these tech billionaires have. And so when policy is being made, who do you think is going to be listened to? Do you think that we're going to curtail AI, that we're going to curtail data centers because, you know, some people in hemp clothes with some cardboard stapled to a sign are marching back and forth in front of the Congress? I mean, they'll pay lip service to them because, again, they don't have any money. The people that have the money are going to control things. And the Uniparty, it's both the Republicans and the Democrats, they'll take the money and, and we'll steam along and lip service will be paid and a few little bones will be thrown to the environmental lobby. So I, 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 this was from an arena Slav 
uh, another energy analyst I follow. She did, follows energy, climate change. She writes on oilprice.com. She also has a sub stack. It's like $50 a year. It's well worth it. She's really, really a super good writer. She's really, really engaged. And she's kind of a little bit snarky and cynical about stuff. She really, she's really a good writer. So this was coming from her uh, tweet that she put out. This is her quote. She says, I predict a big war between big tech and climate crusaders. And then she went on to say, I can't wait. It's going to be delicious. Yeah, I can't either. And I think in that, and then she cited this article. So it says, the world, it's not her article. She just cited an article. It was in the FT, I think. The world's leading arbiter of corporate climate targets is under fire from staff after a decision to allow controversial carbon credits in dealing with emissions, an approach backed by its key financial supporter, the Bezos Earth Fund, according to people familiar with the matter. A big concern among staff members is that major polluters and fossil fuel financiers could be given a green light to buy carbon offsets rather than focus on cutting their own emissions. Yeah, exactly. This whole thing is about money. You haven't figured that out yet? I mean, so they go on, it goes on, it says, it says carbon credits are, quote, scientifically, socially, and from a climate perspective, a hoax, unquote. Yeah, I agree. It's a dodge. It's a scam. It's a scam on top of another scam. And it goes on this uh, article, it says, and could provide a, quote, survival floor for fossil fuel companies, super large scope three, value chain emissions he wrote in a resignation letter so this guy resigned over this he was the leader of this organization he resigned on principle because he said you're nobody's really trying to cut emissions you're just finding these offsets and stuff like that and the people are going to continue to do what they're doing that's absolutely correct even if they don't have that they're going to continue doing what they're doing because the majority of the people that aren't invested in this like this person is that their whole life revolves around climate change they're a tiny minority. They're 0.001% of the population. Again, you kind of have Bezos funding the Earth Fund and yet trying to build the data centers. So again, I, going back to what Irina Slav said, I predict a big war between big tech and climate crusaders. And in a war between big tech and climate crusaders, I predict big tech's going to win. And they'll come up, like I said, this beat bullcrap stories around carbon offsets, and, you know, the politicians will go, yep, see, see, they offset their emissions. And then, you know, there's always people in there, the traders, the people making money, the people doing this, the lawyers, the people, the lobbyists, they're all going to get paid. If you haven't figured it out yet, and, and hydrocarbons aren't going anywhere, sorry to tell you. Again, we've invested in the world $5 trillion in renewables and hydrocarbon uses drop from 81% to 80. They're not going anywhere. The only way you're going to do it is downsizing society, getting rid of the suburbs, people living on top of each other in apartments, 15 minute cities. It's just not, it may happen in the West. They may, you know, descend into a tyranny of the technocrats where they force people to do this. This is what but the rest of the world's not going to do it. Simply isn't going to happen. Nobody in the rest of the world was worried about climate change. Only, like I said, people in the West are worried about it. And, but I think they're going to have a lot more problems here in the next couple decades that are going to uh, take the focus off climate change, like survival. But that's a whole nother discussion. Okay, guys, that's it for this week. Um, we had a lot of stuff. I had so much stuff this week, I couldn't even get it all in here. Uh, some weeks we have the cupboards a little bit bare, but this week we had a lot of good stuff. I think everything's going really in our direction now. And like I said, you got to have a longer term perspective and let these things play out. They take a lot longer to play out than you think. But I think the results of the newsletter speak for themselves. If you understand what we're talking about, if you can get your mind wrapped around it and you can have some patience. I think that you can have a tremendous result for yourself and your family over the next decade as uh, these, these dynamics play out. Again, I thank you for the support. Uh, I talked about how you can support the channel on the front end of the video. Please take advantage of that if you're so inclined and appreciate, again, any and all support and viewership. Thank you very much, and we'll talk to you next week.